All right. Good morning. So glad that you're here with me this morning. I'm going to have, I, this is probably one of the most serious uh, presentations, talks that, that I've had in, in I don't know how long. But one of our greatest vulnerabilities in this life is our concept of time and our concept of patience. We all know that great structures are built one piece at a time, one block at a time, and our lives are just like that. But yet we look at, at time and we, we say, well, I want patience, but I want it now. And we really don't know how important patience is until we've ruined something in our own life or someone else. And I've, I've got those feelings of, of regret and pain because I've pushed and I've pushed and I've pushed till something broke. And that's usually what happens. We want what we want. And we want it right now. Unfortunately, that's not how life works. That's not how things are built. That's not how lives are built. That's not how people are built. You know, we don't. We don't like to wait for our husbands. We don't like to wait for our wives. We don't like to wait for our children. We don't like to wait for our friends. We don't like to wait for food. We don't like to wait for results. We don't like to wait for personal results. We don't like to wait for success. And we definitely don't like to wait <clears throat> for money. But life is a wait. And we wait. And we wait. Time is, is the greatest illusion that, that we, we don't understand. We don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, how much time that we actually have. We, we don't know who will be here tomorrow and who won't. As a matter of fact, we don't even know if we'll be here tomorrow. It's an amazing thing, this thing we call time. And time is only present in this creation, in this world. You know, we totally overestimate, when we look at time, what we can do in a week. We overestimate what we can get done in a month or a year, don't we? You know, we all sit down and we write down these, these real aggressive goals to get done in the next uh, day or month, year. And we miss them and we get frustrated and upset. But yet, on the other hand, we totally underestimate what we can accomplish in 10 years. I think it'd be a smart idea for all of us to take our life in 5 or 10 year increments and plan it out according to that. We can back up into what we can do in a day or what we can do in a week or a month based on that long term commitment but yet we still we want things now elderly people my grandparents and my parents now I, I hear them say <clears throat> so often slow and steady wins the race and it used to drive me crazy because I want things right now my parents and my grandparents and older people that I used to, to associate with, know and love, would say, slow down. You have time. Stop. Smell the roses. Take your time. You know, and some of, some of the people that used to tell me that when I was 20 years old were 40, and I thought they were old as the hills. <laughs> And now I'm, I'm 58 years old and I, I start to see what they're talking about. 
We need to slow down. Take our time. Watch for people. Help people. Do the things that make a difference. Now I'm going to read you a little story. And this is what I was talking about. Um, maybe tearing up a little bit. Because it's a beautiful story. It's a story about a New York City taxi driver. And he wrote in, wrote, wrote a newspaper about this, this story. And, and I'm going to read it to you. He says, I arrived at the address and honked the horn. After waiting a few minutes, I honked again. Well, since this was going to be my last ride of my shift, I thought about just driving away, but instead I put the car in park, walked up to the door, and I knocked. Just a minute, answered a frail elderly voice. I could hear something being dragged across the floor. After a long pause, the door opened. A small woman in her 90s stood before me. She was wearing a pink print dress and a pillbox hat with a veil pinned on it, like somebody out of a 1940s movie. By her side was a small nylon suitcase. The apartment looked as if it had been if no one had lived in it in years, all the furniture was covered with sheets. There were no clocks on the wall, no knickknacks, no utensils on the counter. In the corner was a cardboard box filled with photographs and glassware. Would you carry my bag out to the car, she said. I took the suitcase to the cab, then returned to assist the woman. She took my arm and we walked slowly toward the curb. She kept thanking me for my kindness. It's nothing, I told her. I just try to treat my passengers the way I want my mother to be treated. Oh, you're such a good boy, she said. When she got into the cab, she gave me an address and then asked, Could you drive through downtown? It's not the shortest way, I answered quickly. Oh, I don't mind, she said. I'm in no hurry. I'm on my way to hospice. I looked in the rearview mirror. <clears throat> Her eyes were glistening. I don't have any family left, she continued in a soft voice. The doctor says I don't have very long to live. I quietly reached over and shut off the meter. What route would you like me to take, he asked. And for the next two hours, we drove through the city. She showed me the building where she had once worked as an elevator operator. We drove through the neighborhood where she and her husband had lived when they were newlyweds. She had me pull up in front of a furniture warehouse that had once been a ballroom where she had gone dancing as a girl. Sometimes she'd ask me to slow down in front of a particular building or corner and would sit staring into the darkness, saying nothing. As the first hint of sun was creasing the horizon, she suddenly said, I'm tired. Let's go now. We drove in silence to the address that she had given me. It was a low building like a small convalescent home with a driveway that passed under a porch. Two orderlies came out to the cab as soon as we pulled up. They were considerate and focused, watching her every move. They must have been expecting her. I opened the trunk and took a, the small suitcase to the door. The woman was already seated in a wheelchair. How much do I owe you, she asked, reaching into her purse. Nothing, I said. Well, you have to make a living, she answered. There are other passengers, I responded. Almost without thinking, I bent and gave her a hug. <clears throat> she held on to me tightly. You gave an old woman a little moment of joy, she said. Thank you. I squeezed her hand and walked into the dim morning light. Behind me, a door shut. It was the sound of the closing of a life. I didn't pick up any more passengers that shift. I drove aimlessly, lost in thought. 
For the rest of the day, I could hardly talk. What if that woman had gotten an angry driver? Or one who was impatient to end his shift? What if I had refused to take the run, or had honked once and driven away? On a quick review, I don't think that I have done anything more important in my life. <clears throat> We're conditioned to think that our lives revolve around one important moment. Great moments often catch us unaware, beautifully wrapped in what others may consider a small one. Today, go be patient. Love people and help them. See you Thursday.